Okay, so tonight is going to be the final Bible study uh, for, for this season, I guess. So I'm just going to kind of briefly review everything that we've learned during this series of Zoom Bible studies, which is a lot. But I'm just going to kind of go through it real quickly so that we have a clear understanding of what we have learned. Some of the things may be new to some of us. Some of them might be a little bit confusing. So I hope that this review will help us out. And then if we have questions at the end, or, you know, we could have some discussion at the end as well. Okay, so um, we, I'm not going to go in order of the studies. I'm just going to kind of put it all together. So we've been studying um, Genesis chapter 1, right? And uh, I told you guys that the Bible is not a science book. It is a book about redemption. It is a book that tells us how God is going to redeem fallen mankind through Jesus Christ. So even Genesis 1, the six days of creation, this also is about our redemption. In fact, since this is the introduction of the Bible, this summarizes the entire history of redemption. So the six days may not actually be 24-hour days, but they may be um, long periods within the history of redemption. So it's a summary of what God did for us in the entire Bible, right? So days one through six, let me just draw a chart like this. So one, two, three, four, five, six. Um, you know, it says God created light and separated from darkness. God created the firmament and separated the waters above from the waters below. God, created, uh, God separated land and sea. Uh, God made the sun and the moon and the stars. God made the birds on the fifth day and the fish and sea monster. And then God made man in his image and the beasts of the earth. So what is this teaching us? This is not teaching us this is how God created the universe because it's not. Um, in Genesis 1 1, it just said God created the universe, right? So he's already finished. But here, God, this is more of a work of separation. This is God's work of redemption. Uh, and the, the goal of this creation work is man in the image of God. This is God's work of creating us in his image okay? and separating us from the, the things that God wants us to be separated from. So if this corresponded to the history of redemption, we could say that the first day corresponded to Adam and, you know, Cain and Seth, etc. right? So the line of Cain will be the line of darkness. The line of Seth will be the line of light. So remember in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, remember what that verse said. Let's read that. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8 says, But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like one day. So with God, one thousand years is like one day. Okay? Or one day is like a thousand years. So if we were to look at these six days, that would be six thousand years. And we know that Adam was made on 4114 BC. So let's just say roughly around 4,000. Day one would be 4,000 to 3,000. Again, remember, I want to stress that this is not exact. This is just rough outline. Day two would be 3,000 to 2,000, 2,000 to 1,000, 1,000 to 1, and then 1 to 1,000, 1,000 to 2,000, something like that. So day one would correspond to the, the history between Adam and Noah. Okay. And then day two would be between Adam and, Ab I'm sorry, Noah and Abraham, right? Remember during Noah's day, there was a flood and then God separated the waters again with the firmament closed off, right? Day three is like from uh, Abraham to David. Um, in day three, the land was the key and also plants that had seed in it. So what is the key about land and seed? Land and seed is what you need to have the kingdom of God. And that was first promised to Abraham. 
And also the kingdom of God as a foreshadowing of the kingdom of God, Israel was, came out in the Exodus during this time around 1446 BC. Day four spans from about David to Jesus, okay? Jesus is the sun, right? The prophets and the religious leaders are like the moon. Once the sun rises, we don't need the moon anymore. We need to let that go. We need to hold on to the sun, right? Jesus Christ. But the Israelites did not do that. That was the problem. Day five would correspond to the church era. And then day six will be... Uh, the final day, which is, we could say that this is the end, but we could also call this the era of the beast. Okay, so that basically sums up uh, the entire history of redemption, and it shows us how the history of redemption is going to get played out, and the end will be between man in the image of God versus the beasts, right? So, um, in order to understand about that, we went to Revelation 6, where it, talk, where it talked about the seven seals. Okay. Remember, seals 1 through 4 were about the horses, the horsemen, right? The white horse, red horse, black horse, and then the pale horse. If you look in Revelation chapter 6, verse 8, it gives us a sort of a, an interpretation of these four horses. The white horse and it was called the beast of the earth. And what did it do? It went out and conquered. So if you look in Revelation 13, what is the beast of the earth? The beast of the earth is the false prophet. And this false prophet started to conquer, okay? We'll talk more about that later. Red horse symbolized war, black horse, famine, the pale horse, pestilence. So this is how the, the end times will play out, especially the era of the beast. So let's talk about the white horse. It says that this is the beast of the earth, the Antichrist, the false prophet, and he went out and conquered. So what does that mean? What that means is he, the beastly, he conquered the world with the beastly worldview. Okay. So what's the beastly worldview? Well, let's look at what the beast is in the Bible. The definition of beast is it could be human beings or animals. Anybody, any being without the spirit of God. Without spirit. Or the spirit is dead. Due to sin. That's what Psalm 49 verse 20 says, right? You could be a human being with great honor in this world, but if you do not believe in God and due to sin, if your spirit is dead, then you are like the beast. So what's the beastly worldview then? The beastly worldview is a worldview that denies God and it denies any kind of a spiritual world. Okay. And even denies the human soul. It is a worldview that it is a materialistic worldview. That means it says this worldview believes that in this world there's nothing but matter things you could see and touch okay there is no spiritual world there is no spirit that's what this worldview is and this worldview started to conquer the world in the 18th century during the enlightenment okay and then it started to gain momentum in the 19th century through the Industrial Revolution. But also, during the 19th century, some prominent ideas came to the surface. Things like Darwinism, which is about evolution, right? 
uh, Marxism, which we've talked about, and something that I haven't mentioned yet, but biblical criticism. This came about in the 19th century as well. So what's biblical criticism? Biblical criticism is basically saying the Bible is just a human book. It's not the word of God. So we should analyze the Bible like any other human book, you know, like you would analyze Shakespeare or whatever, Hemingway or any of those books. The Bible is just like that. And the, that means the Bible can have errors and all the things that talk about supernatural stuff, you know, like uh, miracles, things like that, that's all myth or legend. It's not true. Basically, biblical criticism is the ancestor of liberal theology of today. So it denies anything spiritual or miraculous. Any, it denies God. It just reads, it's, it reads the Bible like any old book. Okay? And it wants to get rid of all those things and just get, get, take out from the Bible what human beings like to hear. Like you love your neighbor, etc. I'm not saying love your neighbor is bad, but that's the only thing that they're, they're saying is worthy to read within the Bible. So all these things happened in the 19th century, okay? And also I've talked about, you know, people like Marx, Nietzsche, these guys are also 19th century. And then Freud towards the end of 19th and early 20th century. And then we got into the 20th century. So they were all thinking, you know, all these great developments are happening due to the enlightenment and all that. So we really are going to have utopia, but then what happened? 20th century is the century of wars. It was just endless wars. So in 1914, World War I, um, because of World War I, you had 1917, you had Israel uh, able to return to their homeland. But also at this time, you know what happened? 1917, the Bolshevik Revolution which is the communist revolution in Russia, right? Also 1918, the Spanish flu pandemic. All these things are happening. So think about it. Remember the order of the horses? First the beastly world we conquers, and then there's gonna be wars, famines, and pestilences. So wars, pestilences, and then in 1929, the Great Depression, that's like a famine. And then 1939 to 45, another world war. All these things are happening, right? War, famine, pestilence, and they all began with the beastly worldview conquering the world. So since the 18th century until today, we are living in the era of the beast. The beastly worldview has conquered the world, okay? That's, that, that's reigning over the world right now. Okay? We can't go out and just talk about God and Christianity because we'll get criticized, right? Especially in a public arena, if you go to school or whatever and you talk about your faith, they, they wouldn't like that, right? Because right now the prevailing worldview is a secular materialistic beastly worldview. Okay, so that's where we are at right now. Um, and then we talked about how this worldview starts to persecute the believers so if you go to revelation chapter 6 verse 13 this is the sixth seal and it says that there's going to be an earthquake and then the sun and moon will be darkened and stars will fall okay here the stars symbolize believers and um like pastors or ministers as well okay it says that many stars will fall okay so what that means is because of this era of the beast many believers will fall from their faith okay which has been happening for a long time and then earthquakes and sun and the moon will be darkened how does this happen well first of all earthquake um what is an earthquake, spiritually speaking? In the Bible, earthquake is where truth is shaken. And in the latter half of the 20th century, we enter into this postmodern era. 
what is postmodernism? It's basically relativism, right? So relativism basically says there is no absolute truth. Whatever you believe in is the truth. Okay? So everybody has their own truth. So absolute truth has been shaken and it has crumbled in this world right now. There is no absolute truth. That's what they say. So the postmodern era is a feelings-based worldview. It's changed once more. The modern worldview since the 18th century was more of a fact or science-based or empirically-based worldview. But now we're going into, or we're in the era, postmodern era, which is more of a feelings-based worldview. So what does that mean? It basically means what you feel is right is right. What's most important in this worldview is your feelings. If you feel that this is right, then that's right, even though the facts may say otherwise. If you feel that this is wrong, then that's wrong. So feelings have the top uh, authority in, in this era. That's the kind of day that we're living in right now. Okay. And then how did the sun and the moon uh, get darkened? Well, we need to look in Revelation chapter 9, verses 1 through 5 to learn about that. A star fell from the heavens and opened the abyss, and smoke came up, and along with the smoke came locusts. The smoke symbolizes human pride. Okay. So remember, how does the devil open up this human pride that's, that has been dormant within us? By lying to us, saying, you could be like God. That was the lie. You can be God. That was the lie. And the human beings fell for it. And because of that, their pride came up. And out of their pride came locusts. Spiritual locusts eat up our spiritual fruits, right? That means your faith will all be eaten up. Your faith goes. Once your pride starts to go up, I could be God. I could do whatever I want then your faith is going to disappear. And that smoke is going to block the sun. So when even though the word of God may be preached, you don't want to hear it. It doesn't register in your ears. You can't hear it anymore because of that smoke. And you don't even want to pray because you're too proud. And you're thinking, I am God of my life. You may not say this directly, like explicitly, but the way you live reveals that. That's basically what this feelings-based worldview is. Your feeling is your God. If I feel like doing this, then I'm going to do it, no matter what God says, right? That's the kind of era that we're living in right now, okay? Um, so all of this took place, um, and behind the scenes, the, the, the beings that are making these things happen are the two beasts, right, in Revelation 13. The two beasts are the beast from the sea and the beast from the earth. The beast from the sea is a secular political power, like a king or you know, a country or president or whatever, right? A beast of the earth is more of a religious, philosophical. Or ideological, um, you know, being or force or whatever. So the beast of the earth from the earth is called a false prophet. So you know we talked about Marx and Nietzsche and Freud and, and not only those guys but there are many others. Okay. So what are the relationship between these two beasts? Uh, I'm going to illustrate that by going back to the Garden of Eden. In the Garden of Eden the two beasts work together to make Adam and Eve. Sorry. So in the Garden of Eden, what happened? The serpent lied to Adam and Eve, right? And had him eat the tree of knowledge of good and evil, right? So, the serpent is like the beast from the earth. It is like the false prophet. And then the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is like the beast of the sea. So, I'm talking about this relationship. 
Okay, I'm not saying that, that those are it, but I'm talking about the relationship between the two beasts. So what does the serpent do? The serpent says to Adam, hey, eat that tree. Eat from that tree. Okay, it's going to make you like God. So the beast of the earth says, deceives the people by saying, hey, look, worship the beast from the sea. Then you could be like God. Okay, follow the beast from the sea. Then you could be like God. So the false prophet deceives the people into worshiping the beast from the sea. Just like the serpent deceived Adam and Eve into eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So that's how they were, you know. Um, so the false prophet, the, the beast from the earth, made everybody receive the mark of the beast, right? Which was 666. Okay. And there's so many theories out there about what this mark of the beast is. It, now there, it's all, all over the internet, I guess. Like, you know, Bill Gates is the Antichrist or whatever. And they're going to put some kind of thing in you, you know, like a chip or whatever. And if you don't have that, you won't be able to buy or sell. And it's going to control your thinking, all kinds of stuff like that. Okay. Well, you know, fancy theories, those all sound good. But that's not what the Bible is saying. And in fact, those are not the things that you should be so concerned about. Maybe a little bit. But what we should be concerned about is this. The, the Antichrist, the beast, is already controlling our thinking. It has already started. We don't, they don't need to put a chip in your you know, brain or under your skin to do that. The beast has already controlled our thinking. He's already brainwashed us. It's all over. On the internet, on TV, on media, even in schools, the beastly worldview is trying to control the way we think. It's already out there. That's the problem. And people don't even realize it. They think, oh, they need to put a chip in you to make you to control your thoughts. No, 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 no. The beast has already done that to, to us. Okay. So that's why the only way that we could beat this is by receiving the seal of God. So in the end times, it's going to be completely polarized into two sections. You have the seal of God on your forehead, or you have the mark of the beast on your forehead or on your right hand. That's it. There will be no middle ground. And if you don't have the seal of God on your forehead, then you will definitely receive the mark of the beast on your forehead. Remember, the forehead symbolizes our thoughts and beliefs, right? So, it, you know, it was my prayer and it is my hope that these Bible studies are a time where all of us are being sealed with the seal of God on our foreheads. That's my hope. Especially those of you who are going off to college or, you know, who've graduated or going off to work or whatever. Because when you go out there, the beastly worldview is all over the place. It's everywhere. So we need to be sealed and armed with the seal of God on our foreheads in order to overcome that. So what is the seal of God? Who gets it? It's the 144,000, right? The 144,000 is a symbolic number. Okay. It's not talking about actually 144,000 people. You know, like Jehovah's Witnesses, they said once their church reaches 144,000 members, then the end of the world will come. And then their church went over 144,000. So they had to change their doctrine and stuff like that. The 144,000 is a symbolic number. It's 12 times 12 times 1,000, right? 12, like 7 in the Bible is a perfect number or complete number, right? Because it's 3 times 4. 3 is the number of heaven in the Bible. Why? Because... God is the triune God, right? God the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And He dwells in heaven. Four is the number of the earth. Why? Because on earth there are four cardinal directions, right? North, south, east, and west. So three plus four is seven. Again, another uh, complete or perfect number. Three times four is 12. And then there are also 12 tribes of Israel, 12 apostles of Jesus, etc. Thousand is a number of fullness. So... The number 12, like the 12 tribes and the 12 apostles, are the number of the chosen people. So this is the 144,000 is the fullness, is a number that symbolizes the fullness of 
the number of the chosen people of God. Okay? So, the 144,000 are the ones that have been chosen by God to receive the seal. So, what is the content of the seal? The content of the seal is in Revelation 14.1. So, let's look at that. So, Revelation 14.1 says, Then I looked, and behold, the Lamb was standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his name and the name of his Father written on their foreheads. See? Having what? What was on their foreheads? His name and the name of his father. His name means the name of the Lamb, right? Jesus Christ. So the content of the seal is the name of Father and Jesus Christ, or the Lamb. Okay? Those two names are, are on the foreheads of the 144,000. That doesn't mean that we need to get it tattooed on our foreheads. It means our thoughts and our beliefs are completely geared toward the word of the Father and of Jesus Christ. And, and one more, another thing is in John 14, verse 6, Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me, right? So how do you get to the Father? Through Jesus. In other words, when you believe in Jesus, the conclusion of your journey of faith should be that you reach the Father through Jesus. So somebody who has the seal of God on their foreheads means somebody who has the name of the Father and of Jesus on their forehead means that this is a person who has completed their journey of faith in Jesus Christ and attained to, uh, arrived at the knowledge of the Father and faith in the Father. That's the kind of people that have the seal of God on their foreheads. And these guys, the ones who receive the seal of God on their foreheads, what are, who are they or what are they called? In Revelation chapter 7 verses 2 and 3, they are called. And I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun, having the seal of the living God. And he cried out with a loud voice to the four angels who, whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the bondservants of our God on their foreheads. And then verse 4 says, And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. So in verse 3, it says, These people who are getting the seal are called the bondservants of God. Right? Bond servants. This word in, in Greek is doulos, which basically means slaves. They're God's slaves. So basically, who are the ones that will receive the seal of God on their foreheads? People who have given themselves as servants of God. Okay. So for example, we've, I think we've all heard of the, the Christian band named Casting Crowns, right? They got this from Revelation. I think it's in Revelation 5, where the elders and the four living creatures take their crowns and they cast it at the feet of Jesus. These are all victorious beings. They won according to their faith. They did not give up their faith even in the midst of trials. That's why they received these crowns. It symbolizes that they're victors, that they're kings who are reigning with Christ. But what do they do? They voluntarily cast them at Jesus. What that means is they voluntarily gave up their own freedom and liberty to reign and authority to reign over their own lives. They voluntarily gave it up and gave it to Jesus. Okay. Uh, our senior pastor, our founding pastor, Reverend Abraham Park, one time gave a sermon entitled, Let's rip up our Declaration of Independence. He's not talking about the United States Declaration of Independence. We need that. But let's rip up our Declaration of Independence. This Declaration of Independence is a declaration that human beings have uh, declared, saying that they want to be free from God. They don't want to be free from God's intervention into our lives. But we as believers, we must rip that up. That's like casting crowns, right? Those are the ones who will receive the seal. 
we need to give ourselves to God. So what that means more specifically is this. Basically, we're saying, I am not God. This seems so obvious, right? But it's not because the people of this world are living as if they are God of their own lives. That's what they want. What does that mean? It's all about who decides what is good and evil. This is it right here. Who decides what's good? Who decides what is evil? The world is saying, I decide. Well, at first it was saying, you know, we decide. The world together. Humanity or the country or the law. Now we've gotten to a point, as I said, we're in a feelings-based worldview, right? So now it's everybody decides for themselves. Whatever you feel is good or right is good. And you could change. Today I feel like this is good. Tomorrow, it's not. That's how it's gotten. So everybody is God of their own life. This is how the beastly worldview ends. That's the final destination, is where everybody is God of their own destiny. But the Bible clearly says that that's not the case. And people who live like that will be judged by God. So this is what eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is. Right? TKGE is tree of knowledge of good and evil. What does it mean to eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil? It's basically saying, I want to decide what is good and what is evil. Not you, God. I want to decide. Okay. So this is what the world is. This is how the world has been living for about the last 200 to 250 years. Because that's when the, the era of the beast uh, began, around approximately. Okay. For the last 200 to 250 years, this is how the world has lived. We have lived saying, God, we don't want you messing with our lives. I want to decide what's good and what's right and what's evil and what's not evil. Okay? So that's it. But the Bible says that that's not the case. So who decides what is good and what is evil? It's not my feelings. It's not popular opinion. Not even my parents. Even though when you're a minor, your parents are guiding you to that. It's not experts in the field or what, of whatever. It's not your teachers or your college professors. Not your boss. Only God. Only God has the right to decide that. And he has recorded that in his word. So we must follow what the word of God says. If the word says this is good and this is not, then that's it. So an, an example of that is killing your son, good or evil. What do you guys think? It's evil, right? Well, not if you're Abraham. That is like the, the greatest act of faith that he ever did, right? Trying to kill his son Isaac, right? So to say that we have the seal of God means we need to live according to the worldview that God has given in his word, not according to this world's beastly worldview. And as you can see from this one example, it's completely different, okay? It's not ethics or morality. It is whether are you going to live your life according to the word of God. So if you look in Revelation 14, it talks about the 144,000. What kind of people are they? Well, they have the name of the Father and Jesus on their foreheads. And in verse 3, it says, And they sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. And no one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been purchased from the earth. These are the ones who have not been defiled with women. Women here is not talking about this physical defilement with women. It's talking about spiritually. In Revelation 17, we have the harlot that sits on Babylon. That harlot 
is what this is talking about. That is the spirit of the world, okay? And then it says, for they have kept themselves chaste. They are the ones who follow the lamb wherever he goes, right? This is the kind of life that we need to live. We follow the lamb wherever he goes. Wherever Jesus leads, we follow. And we accept his discernment as the word of God. If he says this is good, then that's good. If he says this is bad, then that's bad. Whatever the word of God says, that's what we need to believe in. That's the kind of lifestyle that we need to live. Okay. So let's end by reading Revelation chapter 22, verses 3 through 5. This is in the New Jerusalem, okay? So these are the ones who will live like this. The ones who have the seal of God are the ones who can live like this. Revelation 22 verses 3 through 5 says, There will no longer be any curse, and the throne of God and, the, and of the Lamb will be in it, and his bondservants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. And there will no longer be any night, and they will not have need of the light of a lamp, nor of the light of the sun, because the Lord God will illumine them, and they will reign forever and ever. Amen. See? The bond servants, those are the 144,000, right? They will serve God and the Lamb, Jesus Christ, and they will see His face, their name will be on their foreheads, and there's no light, no curse, and they will reign forever and forever with Jesus Christ. Okay? So I pray that all of us will be sealed with the Word of God, so that we could walk with him and follow him wherever he leads. And may we be able to reign with our Lord forever and ever. May we not fall into the deception of the beast in this day and age that we're living in right now. Okay? I think I've proven that we are truly living in the end times. So we need to be awake and aware and prepared by faith. Okay? So I pray, this, uh, I pray this blessing upon all of you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your grace and the Bible study that you have provided. God, I pray that the Holy Spirit will be with us throughout this time. And God, I pray that you will go to all of our precious members of Evergreen Church and seal their foreheads with your seal, with the name of our Father and of the Lamb, Jesus Christ, so that we may be protected in these end times, that we may not fall to the deception of the beast, but may we have discernment enough to trust only in our Lord Jesus and follow him wherever he leads. May we hold on to and trust only the word of God so that we could resist the temptation of this world, that we may not receive the mark of the beast, but may we become the true bondservants of God in this day and age so that we could see your face and live with you and reign with you forever, forever and ever. We thank you so much for everything and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's give glory to God with our applause.